Well, welcome everyone to the last yeah. session between you and lunch. So uh, appreciate you being here. I'm Chris Cobbler. I'm the CEO and publisher of the Fort Worth Report. And uh, with me are a couple of rock stars you know and love from last night, award winners. Um, and we've got, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but Mazin and Mukhtar, um, and Mukhtar is especially a rock star because uh, he's a last minute sub on the panel, but uh, we didn't drop any in quality, that's for sure, with having him on the panel. That's, uh, yeah, what he's, he's done is incredible. Um, our panel is talking about our first five hires and the way we, when we um, workshop this, we were gonna have uh, Mazin start because his organization is the oldest and then have uh, Amigo because we're 18 months old and, and uh, still relatively new. Um, that doesn't exactly work out because we're going to have uh, Lila with the Cleveland Signal talk last because she's just about to launch and doing some really fascinating things there uh, with the Ohio Local News Initiative. Uh, but I think it's going to work just as well with hearing what Mukhtar has, has done and let him go last because he's the sub on the panel. <laughs> so that's, that's the logic to our order. But we'll definitely leave time for questions and we got a hard stop at 11.50 because there's a lunch in here right after that. So with that, Mazin, why don't you talk about what we talked about, just your origin story and, and why you um, hired the first five people you hired, what you're thinking, what you, what you thought you knew when you started. Thank you so much for that, Chris. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, this conference has been really great to see so many other publishers similar to us um, and just have a space for us like this where we can have these types of conversations because the first five hires can really define the kind of trajectory of your organization moving forward. So I think this is a really important topic for us to be discussing. So I'm the co-executive director and co-founder of Documented. We were born in 2018. Um, the goal of our site was to cover New York City's immigrants and the policies that affect their lives. My co-founder and I, Mike Siegelbaum, you know, we felt like there was a real hole in local coverage of immigration. You know, both of us had a background in covering immigration in the Middle East and nationally around the US. And we felt that the way immigration was being covered at the local level was really lacking and we wanted to fill that void. But in addition to that, we wanted to create a site that actually was read by the low wage immigrants that were at the center of all the stories that we were writing. And both of us had experiences in our careers where we were writing about immigration, but immigrants were never the intended audience. So we wanted to create a local news site that covered immigrations for the immigrants who were most affected by it. But we were incredibly naive, I will say, when we first started Documented. Um, the first two years of running the site were, as a lot of solo publishers here know, incredibly difficult. Um, it was really the two of us for the majority of that time. Um, you know, in lots of stops and starts, trying to go out to funders and make the case for this work and why it was important. Um, and we really didn't have the resources to bring in full-time staff um, until about two years into our trajectory, which I think is great that we have this diversity on the panel because there's a lot of different ways that um, um, organizations got started. But in 2019, we launched a WhatsApp news service. It was a What's a newsletter was distributed on WhatsApp and in Spanish um, with the goal of reaching undocumented Spanish speakers. And for the first year of its existence, it was really um, a ragtag team that was putting it together. But in 2020, we actually started to get resources where we could start bringing people on. And the first person we hired was our now director of audience and community, Nicolas Rios, who came up with the initial research that led to the WhatsApp news service and was editing it at the time. And this experience of hiring Nico showed me that hiring is the single most important thing you will do as a founder. Nico joining the organization completely transformed Documented and helped it become the organization that it is today. So I would say for, for me, it was a huge lesson in really spending the time thinking about what you need from people, what kind of qualities you're looking for in an organization, and finding the right people that kind of match those because it can have a dramatic effect. When Nico came in, we were able to have a full-time staff member running the WhatsApp news service. It was the beginning of the pandemic. We were getting flooded with questions from readers about you know, the different ways undocumented immigrants were being impacted by the pandemic, and nobody else was covering that. So now that we had this full-time resource working on that, 
he started responding to those questions. Our site started to grow, our traffic started to grow, our recognition started to grow. The organization really was able to take off from that point. And that was really, we owe a huge debt actually to Nico and just his energy, drive, vision, innovation. You know, he brought so much to the team. And, you know, you all know this as people who have started news organizations. I think somebody said yesterday that it's, it can be really lonely. And having someone come in and just re energize us in that way was just a huge lift um, for Max and I and really pushed the organization forward. So it was three of us um, from that point on for another year, and then we got a lot more support and we were able to start growing the team and building the team. And the next person we brought on was a Report for America Corp member, Julia. Uh, Julia is our immigration enforcement reporter. You know, one of our core issues is covering the immigration enforcement infrastructure of the city at the local level. So immigration courts, ICE arrests, USCIS, a bunch of different facets. Um, and that was huge because at that point we were just doing it as a freelance team um, and Max and I are still doing a lot of reporting. So that allowed us to kind of step away from doing the most impactful reporting because we had a full-time person who was working on that. The next person we brought in was Andrea Bicken, who's here. Actually, I don't know, if, I don't know where she is, but um, with the help of AJP, we were able to hire a development director. Now, I wanna say I meet founders all the time who say, I just wanna hire a development director so I can stop fundraising. You know, like, so I can just get that off my plate, I'm done with it, like, just wanna get to that stage. That will never happen, unfortunately. <laughs> you will always be fundraising until you're, while you're at the organization. If you founded the organization, you'll always be involved in fundraising. And I said that for years. I was like, we just need to get that person in and then you know everything's gonna be good. I can do all the reporting, it's gonna be amazing. But now I'm a full-time fundraiser and it's okay, I've, I've embraced that and uh, it's, um, it's something I actually enjoy now. But um, one of the other things that I try and tell people is that you really have to prepare yourself to be ready to hire a development director. So I think a lot of us, because we're not from nonprofit backgrounds, we have a lot of misconceptions about what a development director can actually do. So I spent a lot of time talking to other development directors in news, talking to other development directors outside of news to really structure that position and understand what the realistic expectations would be from a development director, what I could, what kind of resources they would need to succeed in the role and what I would have to do and how my role would shift once that person came in. So I think when Andrea joined, and I'll let her speak to this, but I think we were in a place where we were able to give her the resources that she needed to really thrive with the help of AJP, obviously we were really blessed in that way, but also I had real ex realistic expectations about what she could actually bring to the organization, so we were able to form a really good partnership, and in her first year she's already doubled the budget of the, the organization and has helped us tremendously um, in a number of facets. So the next person we brought in after that, fourth hire, was Fasayo Okare, who is our newsletter writer. So one of the other things about, the great things about hiring an audience person as our first person after the co-founders is it baked in a ruthless dedication to our audience from the very beginning of our, of our founding. And I think a lot of times as reporters, you know, a lot of news organizations are founded by reporters, we think about great stories that we would want to read, but we're not driven by what our audience actually wants and requires from us. So even before Documented started, we had an email newsletter um, that we launched before the, the site began. And for a lot of people, Documented was that newsletter. Like that newsletter was their entire relationship with the organization, and it was an incredibly valuable resource to them. But internally, it was a pain in the ass. It was just something that no one wanted to deal with. It was 20% of everybody's time, and it was something that we didn't really focus on. We actually did a Facebook accelerator, and we realized this is actually one of our most important and valuable resources. We need to give it the resources that it deserves, and we need dedicated focus on that. So the fourth person we brought on was Fasayo, and she led a complete redesign of the newsletter. She now is the only person that writes it. She owns the analytics on it, and she's the internal advocate for it within the organization, and it's just had tremendous success. Um, since she's come on, the open rate is like 40% regularly and people have a much deeper relationship to it and they have a much deeper relationship to the organization 
because they now feel like the newsletter is actually serving their needs. And the fifth person we brought on was Ramel. Ramel has been incredible. He is a community, he's our first community correspondent. So a year prior to him joining us full time, he'd been working with us as an intern with Nico running the WhatsApp news service. And the real dream was that we could have a full time person who treated the WhatsApp news service in a similar way to the way I spoke about with Fasayo treating the newsletter. Somebody who was dedicated to it. If any time anyone sent a message, they would get an instant response and really have that, that white glove relationship with, um, with Documented. So Ramel joined um, as our first community correspondent. He's our Latinx community correspondent. He's a reporter who spends about 40% of his time on WhatsApp responding to people's questions. And once again, being that internal advocate for the WhatsApp community within the organization and letting them drive the coverage in our editorial meetings, in our day-to-day decision-making. Um, and with that, it's really kind of formed the, the formula for how other community correspondents that serve different immigrant communities um, will work and, and continue to proceed. So, and that gets us to the, the fifth hire. Thank you, that's, that's brilliant. And I, I just really enjoy hearing that story because it's, every, every story is uh, so different and it's, we have so much to learn from each other at, at uh, Fort Worth. Um, our origin story is a lot different from a lot of other organizations here in that um, it was very uh, community leadership driven. Uh, um, as I mentioned last night, um, it was a group of community leaders who had been wringing their hands for a number of years as they watched the first slow and then rapid decline of the legacy newspaper and, and wanted to know what to do about it. And uh, they went out, this, they called themselves the Coalition of the Concerned at one point, and uh, went around trying to figure out, they didn't know anything about nonprofit news, they didn't really know that much about journalism, just that they knew they wanted it in Fort Worth, which is the 13th largest city in the country and the, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. So um, they went and approached local foundations, uh, these sort of informal board members at the time, and uh, found one. Uh, that uh, was willing to give a $1.25 million seed grant to get us going. And then they went and actually made the first hire of, of me as the CEO and uh, publisher. And then through that process of uh, hiring me, uh, they met another very talented woman who's here, Trish Rodriguez Terrell, who um, they said, you really should talk to her too. <laughs> and they were, they were right. Um, because our first hire after me uh, was our, our chief development officer, uh, Trish, who had a background working at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and um, had also then gone and worked off in nonprofits and fundraising and, and healthcare. So she sort of had this perfect blend to be a chief development officer of a nonprofit news organization. Um, so that hire made a ton of sense for us. We got together and and talked about um, how we're gonna move forward. We talked a lot at the beginning about this financial cliff we have. Okay, you got, that's great, you got 1.25 million, but we're gonna hire a staff of six to start, is what we said, and if we do nothing, that money runs out in two years, basically. And so, what are we gonna do to extend our runway? And we talked a lot about that, and Trish, um, correctly identified the fact that there are a lot of foundations in, in Fort Worth that have a lot of interest in what we're doing and that w those would be the more of the low-hanging fruits and where we could go initially to raise money to make an impact right away in the community and uh, expand our journalism. So our first hires after Trish were managing editor uh, Thomas Martinez, who had a really strong digital background, someone I had worked with for 20 years or so in different capacities. Uh, he worked way back for Yahoo News and had worked as digital editor newspaper I'd been at before. Because we had to then immediately, as everybody did, <laughs> well, started, started a, uh, a website, a general interest focused on civic um, journalism website and newsletter and, and uh, we had the benefit of um, contracting right away with NewsPack and News Revenue Hub, which was a huge help. Uh, our board in uh, founding did some readership 
research and some focus groups to go around the, and, and get from the idea from the audience of what topics they wanted us to cover. And uh, based on that research, that initial research, uh, we hired from after our managing editor, my managing editor and I hired um, um, an education reporter, a local government accountability reporter, and a business reporter. And those, those beat choices were based on what our audience was telling us they really wanted to see, where, what our mission was. And that's how we got, got to where we were initially in the first, first few months. But it was really, um, had our heads swimming was the fact that our board hired me in February, and um, February 1st of last year, and said, we want to have this website up and running before the big mayor city elections, which were <laughs> in May. So we were going to launch by April. So we went, and I had, I had no staff other than me at that point. So, and we did it somehow, but I, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how we took off from there. And it was pretty, uh, in those early days, thinking, well, we've got this great support and feel good about that in the community, but we're, we're going from zero to building an audience. I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there with that, but that's, that's, that's my thought as I'm trying to figure out how we get going to build an audience out of nothing, right? I'll go ahead. Yeah, right. um, that's really fascinating. Um, the Sahani story is uh, somewhat similar and different from um, Fort Worth and Documented. Um, I uh, was a reporter for the State Tribune before I launched Sahan Journal. And before that, I was a reporter for Minnesota Public Radio. Um, I came to Minnesota in 2005 with my family and did uh, a journalism degree at the University of Minnesota and worked at the student newspaper and then got an internship at NPR where I spent most of my career. And as I was you know, doing reporting for um, the communities and uh, changing beats here and there, I came to realize that there were not enough stories uh, about uh, the Somali community, about other immigrant communities and the African-American community and the native community. And I will um, try to push myself, you know, to be out in the community to do stories about, you know, these communities. And every time I write a story about, you know, these communities, they will become some of the most read stories on, on the website. And then I got, um, I, I got a fellowship that allowed me to go to Columbia University to get my master's. And then I came back to NPR. And then after a couple of months, I left and joined the State Tribune. And when I went there, it was completely different from what I was trying to do at uh, NPR. I had a shock about you know, the largest newspaper uh, not investing enough resources in um, really covering these communities who are growing in, in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota in general. So I um, decided to take a risk. Um, I always dreamed about working for the Star Tribune, and I left within a year. Uh, because I felt um, it wasn't a good fit for me. So I uh, had a good relationship with the um, person who was, who was running NPR News at the time, and I told her, hey, I'm trying to do something. I want to launch a nonprofit. I've been reading a lot about local nonprofit news, and I thought it was a good venue for uh, something that I can test. And I said, I'm really interested and excited about this opportunity. Um, what do you think? Um, so she emailed me and she said, come, we would love to have you back. Uh, come uh, back to NPR, we'll uh, invest in you for 18 months. And if this thing that you are trying to do works for you, great. If it doesn't work out for you, then we would love to have you back as a reporter. And I said, that, that really works great for me. Uh, I would will, I will love to do reporting, uh, but if this works for me, then it will be great. So. Uh, I worked for NPR, I was, a, I was an employee of NPR for 18 months as I was building um, Sahan Journal, and NPR has not done that before. It was something that was really unique, uh, a good partnership, and I was so grateful for NPR to really give me that chance to invest in me for 18 months. I had a family uh, at the time, two young kids, um, and I, I was really grateful to get that uh, support. So I, um, and then Nancy Cassett, the head of NPR at the time, paired me up with uh, a development person who knew how to fundraise, how to build projects, 
and she said, Kate Moose uh, spent, you know, f spent 50 percent of your time working with Mukhtar. Um, and this was someone who really built, you know, on being uh, that radio show and other projects within NPR, and she knew how to fundraise. So she became my partner um, as I was building um, Sahan Journal and we hit the ground uh, fundraising. Uh, we got, you know, real support from uh, three local foundations uh, that allowed us to bring in, uh, to hire some reporters. So our first hire was actually uh, a health reporter um, from Delta Dental of Minnesota. They were like, we are really excited about what you guys are trying to do. We will give you some money uh, to hire a health reporter. And this was just right before the pandemic. We launched in 2019, uh, September of 2019, and the pandemic happened after a couple of months, and that first hire was the most critical hire I have made because it proved to be so useful to um, what happened after, you know, everything shut down, COVID happened. We were like, you know, we have a reporter now who can inform the communities about everything that was going on from the local agencies, from the health, from the health department to the state and translating, you know, those directives from the agencies into multiple languages and trying to really provide essential information to the communities. And then after that, we hired uh, three RFL reporters. And when we went to report for America and said, hey, we, we want to hire three reporters, they were like shocked. Because they used to give like, one reporter here, two reporters to other newsrooms. And here we were like asking for three reporters. <laughs> um, but we had you know, the support. We had good investment from local foundations that allowed us to bring three reporters. So, um, and then after that, I hired a managing editor. Uh, because I was working with contract editors um, with with the reporters, so we we bring uh, we brought in a full-time managing editor to work with the reporters. So the idea was to really um, invest in the newsroom at the beginning to show the to prove the value and the concept that we are trying to do. Because we felt if we can prove the concept of um, reporters going out in the communities and chronicling the uh, stories about immigrants and communities of color. Uh, we can at least have some impact in the local media environment where, you know, you hear it's hard to cover immigrants and communities of color. It's hard to hire, you know, diverse reporters. And we also wanted to show that it's not true. Um, and if, I think if you go to Documented and the Haitian Times and every other newsroom covering these communities, it's really easy to cover these communities. <laughs> it, it's, it's not really difficult to be out in the community to establish trust to um, basically invest in, in their stories and make sure that these communities need to be, um, they need to see themselves reflected well in the media and not just when George Floyd gets killed or when a major break news happens or when other stuff happens. It's, it's beyond that. It's real journalism that truly reflects their needs. And that means being out in the community, asking questions, going to a coffee shop or a neighborhood area or a mosque or a church, and trying to understand what these communities really need. And that's what I was really fascinated when I was a reporter at NPR and the Star Tribune, being out in the community, trying to find rich stories that no one else was doing. And it was really easy for me to be out, to get out of the newsroom and to talk to communities and you can tell, you know, when I, write, when, I write, when I report a story, it just becomes some of the most great stories, in the, you know, and I get calls and text messages from the sources and from the people I interviewed, and it was so meaningful to people, and that wasn't the case when I do um, another story. So I knew there was a huge need for, um, you know, community-centered journalism that truly really reflects this community. So my first four hours was just to prove the concept that we just need to do this journalism, and it's needed, and I'm gonna do it. And we put together a full newsroom, a bare bones newsroom, four reporters, one editor. Um, so that, that's five, and I really invested in the newsroom, and it proved you know, the concept, and we are so grateful to you know, win awards, and um, you know, Bush, our, report, our peers in the you know, local media, I, I talk to them, and they say, we go to your website now and get some story ideas from you. <laughs> Uh, and you can see, you know, after a week or two weeks, you know, with stories on, on one of the local TV stations and in the paper and NPR. So um, in a way, we had a huge impact in, in the local media to um, make sure they are really covering these communities too because they have the resources, 
it's just for them to really be uncomfortable and go to places that um, you know are different from them. It's fascinating to hear your story and hear NPR's role in that too, because one of our earliest, we haven't really touched base on this, but one of our earliest collaborations was with the NPR affiliate KRA, and uh, early on we um, co-hosted a marriage debate, and from there uh, it really has developed into a deeper collaboration, mainly around news, but uh, it has made a big difference in our growth. So yeah. that's been and after, you know, after the 18 months, um, we also um, established a partnership with NPR, uh, so they, they, they co-publish our stories on the website, they invite our reporters on the air, um, we also take some of these stories on our website, we collaborate around election night, um, so we have a very uh, collaborative, healthy uh, partnership with NPR, and now also the Star Tribune is co-publishing our stories um, in the paper. They have um, the, I think, third or fourth largest Sunday circulation in, this, in the whole country, so um, for them to you know, publish our stories and, uh, so that we can reach more people, um, especially the white community, to also learn um, from their neighbors and create good journalism that um, is, uh, from the point of view of these communities, was really um, inspiring too. Well, let's, let's go real quickly before we go to questions to what, Mazin, um, what you do differently now that you're looking back, would, would there be a different hire or anything different that you'd do starting out? Yeah, I think that um, I would definitely keep the the laser focus around audience, but um, maybe would have taken Mukhtar's uh, road and hired an editor earlier on. So Max and I, to give you a sense of our role, we were doing everything for that for that first period of time. So we were, you know, both um, reporting, both editing, both uh, fundraising, both you know, QuickBooks, everything. And then, you know, we kind of split our roles and worked along. Um, I became more kind of the operational side and Max kind of handling more of the day-to-day -day editorial side. But if we'd had maybe some, some editing help for Max early on, who could have really worked with freelancers and um, helped cultivate um, some of the reporters on the team, I think that's something that's really valuable. Obviously, I think everyone here knows it's really hard to hire editors, just generally, um, but, um, but I think that's something that um, would have been really powerful and impactful early on. We're actually hiring a deputy editor right now, um, but I think maybe if that's something we'd brought in earlier, um, it could have helped us with our trajectory. And, and I'd, I'd say, as, I, as we talked earlier, what really struck me was how smart it was to focus on audience and membership and what you did. Um, and I, I still, what keeps me awake at night is, is that, right? How do we keep growing audience? How do we reach more people, how do we connect with them better, how do we build our membership, because that's our, that's our future, that's how we um, can be stable. Um, but I, you know, I don't know how we would have gotten there faster, but I definitely think that, that was definitely what we needed to do. We had the benefit of about um, six, nine months in of uh, being able to hire an audience and membership director through uh, support from Knight and from um, from uh, Lion and Facebook, um, so it was tremendous what we were able to do there. So we have shifted gears in the last, uh, you know, I guess less than a year now, but uh, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. And, uh, and I, I still, but I still think we've got to figure out ways, audience acquisition. I mean, I, I think w thanks to the News Revenue Hub and a lot of smart people in this room, I think we know a lot about how to engage people in the funnel but how we're getting more people to the top of the funnel is what really I spent a lot of time thinking about. How do we, how do we um, crack that nut exactly? Because we don't have the the legacy paper doesn't doesn't co-publish our stories. We welcome them to. We're but they see us a little more competitively than that, unfortunately. Because I think we produce a lot of good journalism that they should share with their readers. But. Uh, I understand the situation, but we're looking for collaborators in every way we can to, to work with. But what, what do I do? Would you do anything different from the start, Munter? Um, we, we experimented with membership and advertising at the beginning, um, which I think was really a great idea um, because we brought in a lot of members and advertisers uh, early on. Um, but I think I, we could have invested more in the marketing side 
Um, I think that is something that you forget, you know, when you come from a journalism, uh, how marketing is so important because you, you want to reach more people, you want to, you know, uh, get more audience. And we, we were getting good traffic on our website and we were very comfortable with that. But I think we could have pushed ourselves a little bit, uh, you know, uh, more to invest, you know, a more, um, more investment in, in marketing and advertising in, in terms of reaching more audience and trying to really um, branding, you know, marketing is something that um, if you are from a journalism background, it, it's not a natural thing that will come to you. Um, we just think if we pr produce great stories, it, it, everybody will it, it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you build it, they'll come. So I think, uh, yeah, we, we undervalued that line item, uh, I think, and I will, uh, we're increasing that now. Um, but I think that that department will have been something that I will have spent more time on. Well, it, it, we've got microphones here, although it's hard on these lights to see everybody, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. My name is Camille Padilla, and I'm from Nueve Millones, which is an outlet in Puerto Rico. Right now, I'm in that process where I want to stop doing so much of the editing so I can focus on business development. And I'm curious how you integrated those first hires to your mission. You know, how did you communicate your mission, but also how did they expand that mission and vision? Yeah, I think onboarding is so important. Um, really, we spend a lot of time really designing our onboarding process. The folks at City Bureau have done incredible work around this. Um, but we definitely cribbed a lot from them. But it's something that I think about a lot. You know, I think there's some data out there that shows that, um, you know, you can trace a lot of people leaving an organization, like the problems that they have to a bad onboarding process. So you really have to kind of, and it's a good exercise because it forces you to distill these things in a way that, that really matters. So we, um, we just onboarded someone last week. Um, we start off, we're talking about the history. You know, how do we get here? You know, we have the first day they get in, they'll join a team meeting. Later on in that day, we have like a 90 minute session where we just sit down and we talk about the history of the organization. How do we get here? What kind of successes did we have? How has the organization changed over time? From there, like the, um, the mission that we're at today, like where we see the organization going. Um, and then in addition to that, um, the team, every single person on the team that's currently working there, and how they relate to you as in your role and what you do, how you fit into all of this. Um, then once you once you brought the person in, you know when I when I was onboarding Andrea, I kind of created like a program of like you know exposing her to this nonprofit news field that we're all strangely a part of and is you know has its own uniqueness to it. Um, so you can do that depending on the role, like kind of build some sort of educational component. And I think once you build that foundation for somebody, then they can really flourish and take it in different directions. But all you can really control is giving them that solid foundation that um, grounds them in the organization and then lets them really flourish and take the roles in a different direction. You want to take that one, Yeah. Um, I think we have somewhat similar. Um, we. You know, we onboard people, they meet with the staff, uh, they ask questions, um, we take them out to lunch, they, we invest a lot of time talking to them, you know, at the beginning, but I think the culture should speak for itself. When someone joins an organization, they should, they should see the culture, and it's easy for them to embrace the openness and everything else going on in the organization. We have um, an open meeting every week, where people just don't talk about the stories, but the, everyone else can ask any question. We can talk about non-editorial related stuff, and we give people the freedom to speak up if they have anything to say. Um, so we embedded that in the culture at the beginning to have this openness and transparency where everyone, if they have something to say or to bring an issue, they will have the chance to bring that without feeling any repercussion or anything like that. So I think um, that healthy culture is, is really going to go far. And we have 99.9 .9 retention rate. There was only one person nice. who left so far. <laughs> and, and, you know, they went to NPR, which is a partner. Uh, <laughs> but we, have, we, we had 100% retention rate. And that is because of the culture that you build, you know, when you start an organization. And the only thing I'd add real quick to that from our standpoint is, um, our core team that started, they, they got it right away because we spent a lot of time just, and then we're, we're all sort of like, hey, kids, let's put on a show in the barn. It was sort of all, we're just all hands on deck doing it. 
but then as we've grown so rapidly to now we have from six to 17, I think we've got to spend a lot more time on onboarding and thinking about what your question is. It's a very good question. Um, Thank you. Over here, I think. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. Uh, and my question is, you know, this gathering to me is so different than what a gathering like this might have been even five years ago. The conversations are very different. And I am wondering, a lot of times as people who build things or try to change the way processes work in our industry, we think a lot about what we could have done differently. I wonder if you all have something that you think in our ecosystem could have been different to have supported you as you grow these organizations. Sorry. <laughs> that's, really, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I think about um, the idea of like diversifying use rooms and um, covering communities of color and, and that discussion that everyone has on social media and meetings and conferences. And here are, you know, amazing people who took a risk to leave, a, you know, uh, for me, it's that Tribune and NPR and uh, others from reputable organizations to address those concerns and issues. And I, I hope, you know, funders um, invest in those newsrooms at a capacity that is equal to the problem that you are trying to solve and not just, um, you know, think that we are local or anything like that. It's a huge problem that we are trying to address. And that really requires a real investment so that we can fix, you know, this industry. And we are really trying to do that. Um, so I hope, you know, that uh, whatever we see out there, um, because this is a problem that has been there for centuries, and no, we know that legacy newsrooms are not equipped or sometimes even interested in fixing those problems. So it's us. Uh, from these communities to do that, and we hope to get the real investment that we need to help us do that. What, and, uh, <laughs> one thing I'd, I'd add, coming from a long time newspaper background to this world, um, I would just say what the nonprofit news ecosystem has grown up in the last five years or so has been tremendous to see. And from a newspaper standpoint, in the old days, we were all so ridiculously competitive, and still some of that still going on. And everybody who comes into this sphere is just inherently cooperative and generous and sharing. And I, I, I think that's we just have to build on that. I, I, I just love that part of what we do. But I, I think we got time for one question before we gotta go. So, or. Whoever's next, I can't tell. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, y'all. Um, my name is Sonam Vashi. I'm with Canopy Atlanta. Um, Mazin, I, I think you talked about, you know, when you're hiring your development director, um, making sure that the resources and infrastructure were there before that person kind of came on the job. I'm sure onboarding was one of those things, but could y'all speak more to that kind of infrastructure that y'all, that really makes a hire um, set up for success before they even walk in the door? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, one of the things I learned in speaking to a lot of other development directors is that development directors tend to develop a certain set of expertise in different parts of development, like major gifts, institutional. It's, it's like, it's a very diverse and complex field. We all just think of like, just get money in the door, everyone's gonna get money in the door. So really kind of understanding where your opportunities are, like where you're at the stage of your growth. Maybe you're an organization that has a lot of appetite for small donations and you need somebody that's really good at running campaigns and like that's the kind of person that you should be bringing in or maybe you have a lot of institutions that really want to support your organization and you want to really capitalize on that. So finding the person with the kind of background and expertise that um, actually matches your needs is one thing because I think sometimes what will happen is you might get a grant from a, um, a foundation to hire a development director and then you go and find somebody who is, you know, did a lot of major gifts for fundraising at a hospital and they come into your tiny organization and they're just like, yeah, where are all the rich people for me to ask for money from? And you're like, well, I don't, I don't know any rich people. <laughs> so they, then they, they don't really, they're not really set up for success in that way. So really just understanding what your opportunities are and finding the person with the background to, to capitalize on them is the one thing you can do that doesn't cost you any money. 
then if you want to kind of build out those other things, realizing that, okay, like, I might need like a grant writer or something like that to assist with this development director or something like that. Um, if that's like an area where you feel like you really want to capitalize and go forward. So just really, that's why I think it's good for you to do your own fundraising for a while so you actually know what is out there. You have a good sense of what the pitch of the organization is too because having a development director come in and build that pitch can sometimes lead to friction between you and the development director. So having a good sense of yourself and what you think the organization should be doing and what you think the strengths of the organization are will lead to a much healthier relationship in my opinion. Thanks. All right, I think, I think we're out of time, but thank you all so much. And uh, it's been a great panel. Thank you to my co-panelists.